Testing, one, two, three, testing. Can anybody hear me? Testing, no, you can't hear me? You can't hear me? Okie dokie. I'll turn it down where you can't hear me then.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, can you not hear? Can you turn me up? There we go. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. We're glad everyone is here today and to uh, worship with us, and uh, we're just glad for you being able to be here, and we're welcome our uh, TV audience also, the online viewers. We have a uh, few announcements. Uh, you probably have had them before, but uh, the Wednesday night classes, uh, there's uh, solid ground parenting, solid ground discipling, and solid ground faith, and solid ground discipleship. So if uh, any of those uh, are of interest to you, well, they're at the 7 to 7 p.m. class on, on Wednesdays. And then it's almost Halloween time, believe it or not. So uh, October 31st, and they need some help. We have time to do this, so it just kind of gets you to thinking about it. Uh, we can donate money online on the app, or you can take it to the office, donate bags of candy, volunteer your time, and then they need 80 cars to uh, line up to distribute all this candy. So anyway, keep that in mind, and uh, later on we'll, we'll uh, get serious about uh, taking care of it. Then also I'm going to pass around a uh, list for the Children's Home of Lubbock Fall Festival, and that is going to be Saturday, September the 17th, and it's a bake sale, and I'll pass it around, and you can uh, sign up on it if you would like to uh, participate. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've created and the opportunities that we have, have to come together to study your word and learn more about your desires for us. And just be with Gary as uh, he presents a lesson today and help him to uh, encourage us to always be faithful Christians. It's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Halloween. Our, our daughter Monica was born in Italy and she was born with, by C-section and so the doctor said I think we'll schedule it for uh, October 31st. And she looked at him and he'd studied in the United States and she said now think about it a minute you want a little witcher to be born on <laughs> October the 31st. <laughs> we were scheduled for 28th. <laughs> so uh, you gotta, you gotta love Halloween. <laughs> and Gerald had been in, uh, in Italy, and Ted Stewart was in Brazil. You have to qualify the Ted's. There's only one Gerald. If you say Gerald, everybody knows what you're talking about. But you know, there's Ted Kell, Ted Stewart, lots of good Ted's. And so, they had been in their respective mission fields and hadn't seen each other for a while. But they both ended up at the lectureship in, in Abilene. And they saw each other across a big open space, a lawn or whatever, and they were going to greet each other and they were going in for the holy kiss. And then they remembered they were in Abilene, Texas and they switched it to a handshake and <laughs> called, it, <laughs> called it good. Because they did not want to, didn't want to be caught with that kind of greet each other with a holy kiss. In Italy, you have to be real careful about the holy kiss. You need to make sure you start on the same side. Because if you mess up and, and you start going the opposite direction, you meet in the middle. <laughs> and that is probably not what you want to do. 
Ah, now it's working up there. We're following this book by Gene Getz, Building Up One Another, and, and he's turned some of the chapters into individual books, and he did that with Serving One Another. He did a, a book that's just Serving One Another, a, a workbook on that. But the passage we're going to look at today is from Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. He says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now, you've heard by now more than once that there's a lot of overlap in these one another things because they're just, they just work that way. And in a few weeks, somebody's going to teach, subject yourself to one another. And so serve one another and subject yourself to one another are awfully close. But I'm going to use whatever I can today, and that teacher's going to have to fend for himself. <laughs> Except the people over here know that teacher's me. And so... <laughs> Whatever I don't use today, we'll use in a couple of weeks. But there is a lot of overlap because we're talking about uh, something that goes together. And they, these aren't isolated things. They are things that work with each other. In John chapter 8, let's take a look at a the story there and see how that develops. It begins with a, an account of a woman caught in adultery, and you're familiar with that uh, passage, the first 11 verses. The Pharisees, of course, the scribes and the Pharisees are just trying to, to get Jesus to trick him, as they always do. And so they bring this woman caught in adultery and ask for his input about her situation. And, of course, legally, the, the consequence is that she should be stoned. And so they hope that he says one or the other, that he says you ought to kill her, and then, then he's going to become unpo unpopular because he, he prompted that, or that he's going to say you don't have to, and then they'll accuse him of not following the law. How many times can they try a, a, a sure deal and lose? <laughs> they don't, they're not quick learners. I mean, they keep trying to get Jesus and trap Jesus, and every single time he wins, and they just don't get it. What I don't understand is why they keep having conversations with somebody who's having a conversation with what they're thinking and they don't realize who he is. Because Jesus doesn't always respond to what they say. He sometimes responds to what they're thinking. And if you're having a conversation with somebody and they are responding to what you're thinking, not what you're saying, you might want to think twice about having that conversation. <laughs> but they thought they would trick Jesus and bring this woman caught, into adultery, caught in adultery. And you know the, the story that his answer was, go ahead, who is, ever, who is without sin, cast the first stone. And they began to dissipate and head their, their various ways because no one, starting with the older people, uh, more mature people, uh, sorry, the, the more mature people on down because the mature people are wiser than those younger people. And so I think it's significant that it started with them. And then they start accusing Jesus of various things. They accuse him of saying, you are bearing witness of yourself in verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then the Pharisees accuse him of bearing witness of himself. And Jesus says that even if I bear witness of myself, it's true, because I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. And you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. He says, you people judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone in it. But I and he who sent me, even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And so then they start a discussion that involves who you are. Who is your father? You, you're talking about your father. Who is it? Who are we talking about here? And so in verse 19, they say, where is your father? And he says, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And then he goes on to say that he's going to be going somewhere where they aren't going to be able to find him. And he points out that he is ab from above, but they are from below. And in verse 25 of John 8, they just come out and say, Who are you? And Jesus says, What have I, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? Verse 28 I like because he says, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. 
Isn't that a wonderful verse? It's when I'm lifted up. Uh, later on, there'd be some, some uh, um, Jewish or Greek Christians who say that we want to see Jesus, and when they go to see Jesus, Jesus is just talk, talking about his death and his resurrection. If you want to see Jesus, that's where you see, see Jesus. But I also like verses 31 and 32. And verse 32 I've had on my letterhead since we lived in Italy back in the 1970s because I think that's just a pretty good motto to have as we go sharing the gospel with other people. In verse 31, Jesus says, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then you have to love their response in verse 33. We are Abraham's offspring. We have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, you shall become free? You've got to love the Jews. We have never been enslaved to anybody. They were born in slavery. They were enslaved to the, to the Assyrians, to the Babylonians. They served the, the Greeks. And there was a Roman garrison stationed above the temple complex just to keep track of, of it. But they've never been enslaved to anybody. And that was their, their response. And then Jesus points out in verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is of the devil. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. And if therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so he says there in verse 34 that everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. So as we think about serving something, we need to be reminded that we, we don't want to be like the Pharisees and say we've never been enslaved to anything because we have been enslaved to sin. And the sooner we admit it, the better. That we were servants of sin, we were slaves to sin, and we were serving sin. In Galatians chapter 4, there is the, the story, the allegory of Sarah and Hagar. And you remember the, the story there in Galatians 4, beginning in verse 21. And he's, uh, Paul says, Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This contains an allegory, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. I'm sure the Jews were expecting something else in this allegory because uh, they are going to be compared with Sarah. Sarah is our mother, and he says, no, Hagar is your mother. And you're talking about a situation where you are in slavery, but our mother is free. And so we need to understand that as Christians, we serve something. We are all servants of something. And in Galatians chapter 5, offers freedom from the law. He points out in Galatians 5 from verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And so they were under the old law. And unfortunately the church in Galatia was being encouraged to, to keep following that old law and to go back to that old law. And he pointed out that that was, that was slavery for them. He points out there a little bit later, though, that freedom is not license. Just because we're free does not mean we can do anything we want to. And that's another thing we need to understand as Christians. We are free. Uh, we weren't ever under the old law, but we're free from serving something like that old law. And we've been set free from sin. But that is not license to do whatever we want to. We are still servants of one thing or another. And so we have been, been set free, but we've been set free for service. And then if you go back to Galatians 5.13 now, that's a little bit later in that same chapter. 
He says, for you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So it's in the context of they were set free from the law of Moses, but they're not to use their freedom as a license. But then he goes on to say that we need to use this as an opportunity to serve one another. I think for serving one another, and maybe for all the topics we've been talking about, it's not so much a matter of a goal as a consequence. I think we serve other people not because we're told to serve other people. I think we serve other people because of who we are. And so I think that if we work on who we are, then maybe we'll, we'll be able to serve one another and it'll just be a natural consequence. In verse 14 of... Uh, of Galatians 5 he says for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement you shall love your neighbor as yourself but if you bite and devour one another take care lest you be consumed by one another and so again he, he looks to the law but he says the law is fulfilled in one word in the statement you shall love your neighbor as yourself but if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. I think it was probably a student at chapel one time who was given the example of, of going uh, coyote hunting with greyhounds. And you let the greyhounds out and they, and they track down the, the coyote and one grabs him with on the front and one grabs him from the back and the third one starts attacking in the middle. And he said, that's what we do as Christians sometimes is we bite and we devour each other and we need to make sure that we don't destroy each other in the, the process. And so for all these years, that's the picture I get when I read this verse, is take care lest you be consumed by one another. Just think of, they're, they're canines. You know, the, the coyotes are canines and the greyhounds are canines, but they're different kinds of canines, so they attack each other and devour each other. And so he tells us that we need to love our neighbor as ourself, and that will motivate us to serve each other. And then verses 19, or 16 through 18, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. He says here we need to be walking by the Spirit. And that's another wonderful study in itself as walking, Christians walking, walking in a certain way. But we need to be walking by the Spirit. And if we're walking by the Spirit, then we won't be carrying out the desires of the flesh because these are in opposition to each other. And those of you who are fortunate enough to be in the Romans class in Senior AIM, <laughs> we've been talking about that in Romans chapter uh, six and seven and eight and uh, we see this developed in the book of Romans that we we have two choices we're one or the other and we're either following the flesh or we're following the spirit and we saw that this week in, in chapter eight of Romans and so if we're walking by the spirit then we won't carry out the desire of the flesh uh, Christianity is not a religion of not doing something believe it or not some people think that Christianity is a matter of not doing something. You can't not do something. You have to replace it with something better. And the example that these people know is I'll tell you to stop thinking about that purple elephant. And the more I tell you to stop thinking about that purple elephant, what are you doing? You're thinking about a purple elephant. And so if as Christians we're focused on not doing something, we're going to be awfully focused on that thing that we're not doing. But if I tell you to think about a green rhinoceros, you stop thinking about the elephant and you're thinking about the rhinoceros. And if you read in, in Ephesians where Paul talks about we, the, the Christian walk, we need to put this off and replace it with that. You don't just not lie. You speak truth to your neighbor for his edification. You don't not steal. You work with your hands so that you can help other people in need. And so we either are walking by the spirit or by the flesh. And if we want to stop walking by the flesh, we need to start walking by the spirit. And then it's, it automatically happens that we are spirit walkers instead of flesh walkers because the two are in opposition to each other. We also have, have figured out that the, what the flesh presents to us is never 
quite as obvious as we think it might be. Satan doesn't play fair. And if you expect him to present a temptation to you in the form of some evil looking monster and you'll know to resist it, then you may be surprised. Because something, sometimes it's things that we want that he uses to get us. And so we need to be very aware of, the, of, the, of Satan and the devil and his attempts to, to get us with things that may look okay to us. They may be fine. But if we're following the flesh, then we need to be careful because we're not carrying, we're not following the spirit because the two are in opposition to one another. The spirit sets its desire against the spirit and the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And so that we can't do the things that we want to. We cannot be motivated by just whatever I want to do, I'm going to go ahead and do it. We need to evaluate in terms of, of spiritual outcome and to make our decision that way. And he goes on in verses 19 through 21, and he expresses the deeds of the flesh. And he says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's quite a list, isn't it? But this is still in the context of how do we serve one another. We serve one another by focusing on the spirit and not focusing on the flesh because as long as we're focusing on the flesh then we are tending to devour each other and bite each other and complain with each other but if we're focusing on the spirit then we won't be doing those things which brings us up to the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter 5 22 through 25 he says but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such things there is no law now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live by the spirit let us also walk by the spirit you know how to remember those don't you you know the song the ones who are in class know the song some some are saying no I'm not gonna sing the song <laughs> do you know the song you ask you ask the kids name a fruit and so, who wants to pick a fruit? Tell me a fruit. Banana. banana. The fruit of the Spirit's not a banana. The fruit of the Spirit's not a banana. And if you want to be a banana, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the Spirit because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh, oh. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You love the, so the solo? <laughs> the, next time, the next time you can sing with me. We learn some of the greatest truths in children's songs. And that's such a good way to, to learn things. And I guess as adults, we are too uh, sophisticated to sing a kid's song. Uh, sometimes I've been known to break into the wise man built his house upon the rock. That's a good one. And so there are a lot of good ones. There was a, one of the great theologians of the 20th century who, at about age 20, thought that based on the fact that uh, what the Bible says our lifespan might be, although I don't think that's what that passage is talking about, that he might live to be about 80 years old. And so he, he devoted the first 20 years of that period to studying biblical languages and really mastering biblical languages. And then the next period he devoted to applying that to learning as much as he could from the original languages uh, from the scriptures. And in the last 20 years of that period, he devoted it to sharing that with other people. And at the end of that time, someone uh, came up to him and said, what, what is the, the deepest truth that you have learned? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so, if you want to remember the fruit of the Spirit, you need to learn the song. <laughs> and that way you can remember what it is, that this is the fruit of the Spirit. So our question is, for us, if we want to learn to serve one another, how do we do it? We don't do it because I tell you go serve one another. As soon as you go out of here, you find a way to serve 
somebody else. We do it by walking in the Spirit. We need to focus on spiritual things and not focus so much on fleshly things. The fleshly things get in our way, don't they? In our everyday lives, they have a way of catching up with us. They have a way of overwhelming us. And in and of themselves, a lot of them aren't bad things. They're just fine. But they are things that take the place of more important things. And so if we want to learn how to uh, uh, serve one another, we need to learn to walk in the Spirit. You know, this isn't a brand new concept with the New Testament. That in Isaiah chapter 2, it says, Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Even under the old law, they were expected to walk in the light of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 and 21, he says, Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher, and your ears will hear, will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right or to the left. Isn't that a wonderful thought that there's this little voice inside us? It doesn't come, there's, there's nobody really sitting on our shoulder, the devil and the angel on our shoulder. But if we, I see some surprised faces back there. Uh, the, but if we spend our time in the word, the word is going to whisper in our ears as we come to a crossroads. And it's going to say, go this way or go that way. And we want to walk in the, the way of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 35, verses 8 through 10 he says that a highway will be there a, a roadway and it will be called the highway of holiness the unclean will not travel on it but it will be for him who walks that way and fools will not wander on it no lion will be there nor will any vicious beast go up on it these will not be found there but the redeemed will walk there and the ransomed of the lord will return and come with joyful shouting to zion with everlasting joy upon their heads, they will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. There is a, a highway, a, a roadway, and it is called the highway of happiness, and that's the road that we walk on as we serve, as we walk in, in the Spirit. And then Hosea says in Hosea 14, verse 9, Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. The ways of the Lord are right. That is the path we want to follow. And we're going to walk in those ways, but transgressors, transgressors will stumble in them. So how do we serve one another? How are we motivated to serve one another? If we are walking in the Spirit, uh, then we're going to automatically, I think, serve one another. And then... If we're going to want to learn to serve one another, we need to put off the deeds of the flesh. There's a reason that's all in one context in that chapter, in Galatians chapter 5. We need to put off the deeds of the flesh. And you're familiar with the, the list, immorality. And of course we need to understand Jesus talks about our thoughts, our immoral thoughts, as much as our immoral actions. And we might say that we're not immoral people, but we need to think about our thoughts and see if we fall into that category because it's easy to make that uh, something that applies to everybody else but it doesn't apply to us impurity and there we get into our idea of holiness uh, God wants us to be holy he wants us to be pure he wants us to be set apart and so are we doing things in our lives that cause us to be pure or impure sensuality there's so many of these things that our society really prizes it's amazing how our society gravitates toward these, these things and this idea of sensuality. Just watch a commercial. Just watch a television program or a movie and see how much these things infiltrate uh, our common culture, the things that we see and do every day. Of course, idolatry is something we have no because we don't set up little stones and statues and things. But greed is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. The New Testament says so. And so... An idol is anything that we place ahead of God, above God. And in our culture, it is greed. It is covetousness. It is wanting more and wanting what other people have. Idolatry is as much present in our society today as it was in Roman society 2,000 years ago. 
It just takes a little bit different form. Sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disten disputes, dissensions, factions. Some of these are getting too close to home here because they're, they're big sins and little sins. And sins of the tongue are just little sins. That's why Revelation 21.8 says, all liars. You know that song? <laughs> you don't know that song? Revelation, Revelation 21.8, 21.8, liars go to hell, liars go to hell, burn, burn, burn. <laughs> you won't forget it. <laughs> but, you know, we need to stop and think and take, take lying seriously. You know, if it's just a little white lie, maybe it's okay. Just, just, just a little white lie. It's not a big lie. See, you're going to take that home with you. It's I was thinking of teaching that to a five-year-old. Uh, yeah, that might work. That may work on the five-year-old. The, the burn, burn, burn part you might want to leave out. But if you, if you look at the list of things that God hates, and you look at some of these other lists, a lying tongue is right there. And we think, well, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't commit adultery. I didn't steal anything. There was that little lie I told, but that really wasn't such a, a big deal. Our strife with each other, our jealousy of each other, our outbursts of anger, our arguments and disputes, our dissensions and disagreements, and our factions. We never have that in the church, though, do we? That doesn't exist in the church. It's sometimes these th the, we want to leave this list out there somewhere because it's them. And sometimes it hits too close to home. Envying. That's kind of up there with covetousness, isn't it? Drunkenness. Carousing. Just, it's just having a good time. Just having a party, that's all. And so these are the deeds of the flesh. And if we want to learn to serve one another, we need to get those out of our life because they get in the way and they cause us to, to envy and to dispute instead of just loving each other and serving each other. But we don't just not do something. We don't just not do those things because as long as we are practicing the fruit of the Spirit, as long as the fruit of the Spirit is part of our life, then we don't have to worry about the deeds of the flesh because it doesn't leave room for it. The first fruit of the Spirit is, not surprisingly, love. And we saw earlier in this, this series uh, to love one another. And love is the, the foundation for just about everything, isn't it? It all begins with love in a, in a Christian type love. But the fruit of the Spirit is also joy and peace. That means Christianity is a, is a bed of roses. It's all easy. It's a smooth sailing all the way along. Christianity is not an absence of challenges. Christianity is not a, an absence of hard times. Christianity is the presence of those things, but making it through it with the help of God. There is nothing that comes our way that we cannot face with God as our helper. And so the, love, the joy that we have is not because we don't have any problems in our lives. Uh, Christians are challenged by, this, by Satan more than other people because Satan already has them. He's not going to work hard to get somebody he already has. He's going to work hard on you because you are who he wants and he doesn't have you. And so being a Christian doesn't say that you're not going to have any challenges or temptations in your life. It's just the opposite. Satan's going to focus on you. But with the strength of God, you can overcome those things. And that's joy knowing that nothing comes your way that you can't handle with God, that you alone can never handle anything, but God can handle it. That's one of those beautiful phrases in the New Testament where something's going along and it says, but God. And the peace that we have as Christians is the same way. It is, it's not a lack of conflict. In the Jewish world, peace was a lack of conflict. If there was not an enemy at the gate getting ready to attack Jerusalem, they were at peace. Christians, there may be an enemy at the gate, but we can deal with it because God is there with us and he gives us peace. Patience is a little bit hard to come by sometimes, isn't it? To develop patience 
and have the kind of patience that we need to have as, as Christians. We need to develop kindness. Can you see how these would contribute to serving one another? If this is our attitude, we will serve one another if we're kind people, if we're good people, if we are faithful people, if we are gentle people, if we practice self-control. So how can we learn to serve one another? I can tell you go out there and serve one another, but you'll probably forget it when you get out the door. You won't forget it, but you'll say, well, how am I going to do that? You do it by walking in the Spirit. You do it by getting rid of the deeds of the flesh, and you do it by putting on the fruit of the Spirit. There are some not one another passages in this same section. Did you know that? That'd be a whole, whole other series, the not one another passages. In Galatians chapter 5, and verse 26, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And so as Christians, not only do we serve one another, but we do not challenge one one another in a, in a negative way, in a bad way. We do not envy one another. And so maybe one of you can put that stated together on the not, not one another passages of the New Testament. Full disclosure, you know that you've, you've learned that many of us begin a study by doing a word study and seeing what the Bible has to say about that word. Search all the passages and uh, that's how I usually start out. I don't go to a commentary and see what somebody else thinks about that passage. I see what the Bible says about that package, passage and start looking up its instances. And so when I started working on this lesson about serving one another, uh, I, when I went there, I knew I was going to find the verb form of what we call a deacon, diakonos, because that's the word for servant. And so it says serve one another, and so I was expecting the verb form of uh, of diakonos, it means to serve or to minister. Uh, by the way, uh, unfortunately, Greek does not have capital letters to identify proper names. And sometimes the word diakonos in Greek just means a servant. And sometimes it means an office in the church. Sometimes an angel is a capital A, and sometimes it's just a messenger. Sometimes an apostle is an apostle, and sometimes it's just somebody who is sent. Sometimes spirit is a capital S spirit and sometimes it's a lowercase spirit and so we have to sort through it but anyway the, the word that I was looking for was the verb form of diakonos, diakonia but that's not what I found here in this passage in Galatians because it is the verb form of doulos and doulos is a slave it does not simply say serve one another Galatians says to become a slave to one another Thayer says this word means to be a slave. It, uh, talking of a nation such as Israel, to be in subjection to other nations, it means to obey or to submit to. In a good way, it means to yield obedience. But in a bad sense, we also become slaves of sin. We become slaves of uh, negative things. And so that was the word that, that Paul used here in Galatians. It was not servant, it was slave. There is a theological dictionary the new testament that is in multiple volumes and it's about this big and so if you want to look something up and see everything you never wanted to know about the word the kid will tell you going clear back to its use in in ancient greece but it says that uh, diakoneo has a special quality of indicating very personally the service rendered to another and he talks about another word, but he says in Diakoneo, there's a stronger approximation to the uh, concept of a service of love. And that's not the word that he uses here. He uses the word duleo, which means serve as a slave without stress, with a stress on subjection. And so I probably should have saved this for a couple of weeks from now when I talk about subject yourselves to one another. It's odd that the Galatians here that says serve one another is the passage that we are using for serve one another would really fit a couple of weeks from now and submit to one another. When we do become servants of one another, slave to one another, we are following Paul's example. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 19 that though I am free from all men, I made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. 
And when we make ourselves slaves, we are following Jesus' example. Uh, Romans 15, 8, Paul says, For I say that Christ has become a servant of the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. Paul to the rescue, or Peter to the rescue. There is another passage that says serve one another, and it uses the diakonos, the verb form of diakonos, and that's in 1 Peter chapter 4. And so you can skip everything we just said because that's for the next time. 1 Peter chapter 4 is another passage that says that we need to serve one another. In 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 7, Peter says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good servants of the manifold grace of God. And already in this passage, he's talked about one another three times. He talks about keep fervent in our love for one another, be hospitable to one another. And then he says, employ our gifts in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God. Whoever serves, let him do so as by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And that's a good thought to conclude with, I think, is what Peter says there in 1 Peter chapter 4, is that we all have different gifts. We all have gifts that God has given us. And we need to employ those gifts in serving one another. And the more we use those gifts, the more that we are serving each other. If, we, if uh, we're speaking, let it be by the, great, the strength that God supplies. But the goal in everything we do, the reason we do everything we do is to glorify God. And if we are glorifying God, then we're going to be serving one another. And we're going to be doing what it is that, that we need to do. And so since Peter ends with an amen, I guess we'll end with an amen there too. But serve one another, not because I said so, but because uh, you have started walking, or you've already started walking in the, in the spirit, that you have put off the deeds of the flesh and you are living with the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you very much. That was even a little ahead of time, wasn't it? That didn't, that didn't get the... <laughs> were, you, were you getting ready to do the, the thing? Thank you, Gary, for that lesson, and it was very appropriate. We have several on our prayer list, and uh, uh, Freddie Clement is in Whisperwood Nursing Home. Uh, Dolores Sutherland is in Trust Point. Carl Nimitz uh, had uh, his grandson passed away. And Thanksgiving for the rain and the green grass. Well, it's still taking a little while to get it green, but uh, it's, we're working on that. Uh, Jan Fornham, uh, severe health issues for SIBI. Uh, many are traveling involved with that. Uh, all the ones who have lost loved ones this week. Denise Davis and Pat Gerzema. I may not have pronounced it right. Uh, Floyd Boyer continues infusions for cancer treatment. Again, thankful for the rain. And Janet Jones, uh, Jeannie's sister-in-law, is in Garrison. And she'll be having uh, getting a new hip joint uh, sometime in around the 1st of October. 
And then I guess I need to add myself to this list because I've been battling AFib for about 50 years. And uh, I'm going to have uh, another hard relation uh, Thursday. So, Boyd, if you would come and uh, lead us in prayer. Would you pray with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can gather here to study your word. And Father, we're so thankful for our teachers and for our ministers. We ask that you would continue to bless them. And Father, we're so grateful that we have an example through your word of how to live our lives. And we pray, Father, that we will follow the teachings that you have meant for us in your word and that we will strive to be like your son, Jesus. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless those that are hurting, whether it be illness or the loss of loved ones. Give them comfort and healing is our prayer, Father. Father, go with us as we walk through this week. Forgive us when we fail you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.